Welcome to the Rising Tide Podcast with D. Klein and Eric P. Rhodes. Each week, the Rising Tide Podcast brings you the latest stories from a world where art, technology, and culture converge. Ride the wave of the future with us. The tide is rising, and the possibilities are endless. Hey, man. Hey. How's it going? Good. We're in our unintentionally matching outfits. Yeah, I think it's okay. I think we just have the same color palette uh, that we enjoy. Yeah, probability of us matching is (laughs) pretty high. (laughs) Non-zero, for sure. (laughs) How's my, am, am I coming in okay to you? Yep, you're good. Okay, good. So yeah, it's been a little bit of a summer break for us. Yeah, we took two weeks. Thank you mm-hmm. for allowing me the space to do that. Yeah, I, uh, for sure. I I needed it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was off to uh, the mountains again for a few days, so it worked out. Nice. Try to get out there a couple times a year. So okay, buddy. You get a little dog. bit of a break this summer at all? Go anywhere nice? No, not really. Um, it's been pretty heady. I have some new adventures coming up. Hmm. with school i'm i'm we talked offline about this but i'm you know graduate school is coming this semester um Hmm. studying industrial relations again furthering my my explorations in sort of decentralization and web3 and how how the future of work will be impacted um i don't know where it's going to take me i just know that like i'm being driven internally to explore this and the opportunity to explore it through an Some would say level. it's your calling. Yeah, I don't know if it's my calling, but it's certainly something that uh, I'm being driven to. Why would you? Why would you call it my calling? It's kind of a spiritualization of of that, you know. There's this kind of built-in desire, and you you can't maybe put a finger on it, and it feels like you're you're called to do this, like something that you're destined yeah. to do. There is, I've been, I've been, I heard this said before, not about me, but about people like me, um, being a seeker Hmm. and, you know, seeking a truth or seeking some sort of education or seeking, there's something that I'm like, it's wired into you. Yeah. I can't, like you said, I can't exactly put my finger on it. I know I have to explore this further. Don't know Mm. why, but I'm being intrinsically driven to understand what about Web3 is going to be good for the future of work and what about Web3 is going to be bad for the future of work. And then most importantly, can I help mitigate the negatives, right? And so like, that's sort of where I'm being driven with, with that. That I don't know suits if... you. It suits you, and I'm sure it does many people in Web three. The notion of being the exploratory, curious type. Yeah. Right. Fuck. I'm really fucking up today. <laughs> it's all good, dude. <sighs> I haven't yeah. really said that out loud. Um, so you ever take one like... of those personality tests? You know. Yeah, I'm. Uh, which ones? I've taken them all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's the ones that have like the four letters or whatever, you know, and then it kind of categorizes you as that. Mine, unsurprisingly, I am a debater. I think it's the biggest character characteristic for me. I forget what all the other ones were, but the debater. I'm definitely. a, I'm a INTJ. Okay. Uh, let me. That pull sounds it up. familiar. It might actually be really similar to mine, actually. I, but I always thought you were extroverted. Right. Yes, I would say. Yeah. So maybe part. an ENTJ, mm. but I that sounds a, that sounds more that sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if I can, Eric, I got to pull it up, right? You got to pull it up right now. Yeah. Well, just one of my aspirations. You just have matter. that I'm handy. Gonna, wow. I do somewhere. I can't. I can't like find it right now. <laughs> but basically, I think it's called uh, the aristocrat. Is is what I am. All right. Explain. Um, Please, I don't. I don't get to. I, I I want to. I got to pull it up. <laughs> <laughs> Can we pause? Sure. All right. So, um, 
Well, first of all, let me preface this with saying that I've created a uh, a GPT. Oh, really? Yeah, for me personally, that I call Eric's Life and Career Coach. Wow. And I've included all of the uh, all of the personality tests I've taken, all of my career history. Um, the the jo each job's role role and responsibility, uh, my experience about those jobs and my feelings about those jobs and a whole bunch of other mm -hmm. like personal inputs, um, and so to answer your question before I took the the personality test the Myers Briggs, and I am what's called an INFP dash T, um which stands for introverted, intuitive, intuition, feeling, perception. And then the T is turbulent, which totally mm. describes okay. my, yeah. And then the, the 16 personalities way of describing it is that it's the mediator. So basically uh, I have a strong desire to help others and bring harmony in environments, which is totally uh, my personality. And it's interesting you're drawn to labor relations, which is like, perfect fit for that no wouldn't you say so yeah yeah it's it's um i was doing change management before and mm -hmm. employee and customer experience mm -hmm. so again uh really drawn to sort of helping people and creating harmony in disharmonious places um See, yeah I, so, I i actually checked mine too and it's mine's actually entp you were close you said entj but entp prospecting is the fourth one debater I love okay. I love I love taking up uh, contrarian ideas and arguing, even though it might make other people annoyed. I actually just really enjoy taking up arguments and discussions. Yeah, so it comes kind of comes off sometimes as being how would you say it can seem like annoying or rude if I'm not careful. You play devil's advocate a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, like you were saying before, I think off off screen, you're sort of uh, sometimes disagreeing to just disagree. I like right? to disagree to kind of pick apart someone's argument sometimes. Uh, yeah, okay. To go, okay, what is your argument really here? Yeah, yeah. And that makes sense. Like, in a way, you're an explorer. So you called yourself the mediator, which makes sense because you're sort of you know, the way I just, I would think of a mediator is, is no, you're not a mediator. I'm the debater, mediator. Debater. You're the debater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the mediator. I'm the one that's looking to like drive harmony in, you know, although I could be a little chaotic, which is where I think the, the turbulence part comes in my, uh, the turbulence specifically stands for, uh, oh, <laughs> I might experience self-doubt, anxiety, and I'm sensitive to stress. Absolutely mm. true. Uh, I'm more self-aware and motivated to grow. True, which leads to overthinking and being emotionally turbulent. 100% true. <laughs> so how much of this is like the horoscope effect where it's like, mm. oh, this fits me to a T, blah, blah, blah. And it's just you kind of pick the parts that fit you and you skim over the parts that don't match. I think Myers Briggs has done a pretty decent job of of being able to identify personality traits. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're that all the time everywhere. Right. Right. But what I can say is I've also taken something called the Mesquite, which is MS mm, barbecue. No, M S C E I T. And it's a test that um is sort of like it's an IQ test for your emotions. Oh, really? And it's backed by science. It isn't like those online. So it's emotional know, intelligence. Okay. Emotional intelligence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something that I was diving into a little bit in my art with, you know, improving my own emotional intelligence. And what I've learned through this, I scored low in something called blends huh. and not blends, not like disruptively low, just lower than everything else. All right. Um, and it was below normal. And blends are being able to identify complex emotions. Hmm. Uh, I could, I could, I'm, and really it's blends within myself. I have a hard time identifying and, and dealing with complex emotions. I didn't, I never really grew up. I never really 
developed a language for describing those emotions. So everything was either I'm angry, I'm frustrated, and I wouldn't be able to say anything more than that. I, I learned this early uh, four years ago in therapy that I was saying, well, I'm just frustrated or I'm just angry. And they would push and push and push. And I wouldn't be able to describe what I was, what I was expressing yet. Uh, going into school, one of my courses was uh, around emotional intelligence. And as part of the course, you took this, this test that was being run by um, uh, a lab at Rutgers and it's well-renowned test mm -hmm. been developed over decades. So it's basically the preeminent IQ, IQ test for your emotions. And I learned that I was high attuned to other people's emotions um, and I could help them work through their own emotions and be able to say and do and intuit the right thing to be the right person to be and the right thing to say in moments of high tension with other people's emotions. Hmm. I was poor at understanding my own emotions, which tracks for me, completely tracks. Um, so does I that learned, guide you in your everyday life to some extent? You like, is it something that you've taken to heart? You think? A hundred percent. Yeah. And, um, so one of the things you can do is you can, you can train like, uh, like intelligence, emotions can be trained, like understanding emotion can be trained in yourself. What it takes is like simple techniques, uh, journaling every day hmm. about what you're feeling and mm -hmm. actually attempting to describe more than I'm just angry and I'm just frustrated. What is it about that's frustrating? Why is it frustrating? And then all of a sudden you begin to tease out a more complete uh, and comprehensive language for describing which frustration used to be like this one thing that could describe a thousand well now frustration is a spectrum and there's all of these kinds of feelings in the spectrum and i went and took it a step further from what i learned in class and started building this i called it uh improving my emotional intelligence through art and mm -hmm. i created I color palettes yeah, yeah i created I color that. palettes yeah. and identified emotions with those color palettes because that visually works for me. So now okay. I can I could see a color. It's not automatic. I wish it was, but I could pull up my palette and say, okay, I could I could look at a situation and see the color palette that it derives, which is, you know, it's maybe a little foo fooey for some others, but for me, it's just another way of building confidence and being able to describe what my internal chaotic state sometimes feels like huh interesting yeah so i mean for me taking the test i use this website 16 personalities have yeah. you ever looked at that one yeah that's based on the myers-briggs yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it is interesting it's interesting to look at it's interesting to think about your own strengths and weaknesses and become more aware of them yeah there's another one called the enneagram enneagram yes i'm aware of that uh, one as well enneagram yeah, yeah. did yep. you take that one i did um I think I'm a nine. Uh, I think I'm a nine. If I remember correctly. I got to ask my GPT, what's my Enneagram? <laughs> Is it, that's crazy that I, I know some GPT. people who got super into it and they would be able to talk to me and say, oh yeah, you're this and these are your da 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 da. It's like, wow, I can't get that into it. I find it confusing compared to some of these other categorizations. Yeah, Mars Briggs, especially with the way that 16 personalities just describes sort of the whole class of, you know, I N what are you? I N E N T P. Oh, E N T P. And it gives a whole just sort of like visualization of what that class of people are. Right. It's easy to understand. Yep. I think what I like about the Enneagram is it kind of points to the numbers that cause you problems and kind of is a little more clear about that in terms of areas that you need to be careful about. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what'd your Mine GPT is, say? Uh, it said, I am, my Enneagram is four, 
wing yeah. three and wing five. Like it was both of them were were equal. So aren't the wings a... aren't you always gonna have the wings surrounding your number, but just maybe to a lesser or greater extent? Yeah, but I think that there's what I think typically there's one wing that is Oh, I see, I see. More than the other. More right. than the others, right? Mm -hmm. I have two that were the highest were exactly mm -hmm. the same. Okay. Is there a test online weight. for Enneagram? Because I always I read through the book Yeah. Uh, years ago. And I remember yeah. just I being a nine, I had a hard time reading through the whole thing. Mm. <laughs> Which apparently is suited to I think the nine. I if I'm remembering the correct number. I believe there is a test. Maybe I it's believe a six. I, I don't remember. I believe I paid for it. Uh, it was like twenty bucks or something like that. It wasn't much. Mm. Um, and I, my enneagram type is four, the individualist, which uh -huh. makes sense. Uh, emotionally intense, creative, and expressive. Mm -hmm. And then my wing three achiever, which if you know anything about me now, like I'm trying to achieve like these crazy academic goals and personal goals and stuff like that. Uh, and then the other one is the wing five was influence. Uh, influence, what is influence on type four? Type five adds a desire for knowledge and understanding, which is exactly what, you know. So See, and then me. when I look up type nine, it says peacemaker. I wouldn't say that I'm a peacemaker, so maybe I'm not remembering correctly. Well, let's type, look at type six. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a dyslexic moment. It could be. Yeah, the loyalist. I don't know. I never really pinned it down with Enneagram. I don't remember pinning. I remember other people having to help me to, to pick. Well, I, I will find I will, if if it's something you want to do, I'll find the link and send it to you. I, yeah, we, sure. We're not, we're not promoting this, so no, you yeah. are not sponsored by who wrote Enneagram? Enneagram. Is it Enneagram? I was calling it Enneagram. You could funny. be right. You could be right. I, no, I have no idea. I, I mean, it's double N, up. so Enneagram actually makes more sense when you think yeah, about it. Yeah, I have it. no idea. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, how do we get down this path of personalities? I don't know. We were talking personalities. We go all over the place on this show. We do. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I will say this. Uh, I think that your uh, E and my I mm -hmm. uh, work well together. Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Who did write Enneagram or Enneagram? I don't know who wrote it. Now I want to know. Oh, it's a whole pile of authors. Okay. I thought there was a book written by one particular person about it, but no, I think it's like a scientific study. Okay. Yeah. The Enneagram Institute. That's what I, that's where I went to. Okay, cool. I really should know more about it because I did read a book about it, but it's, I don't know about you, but there's just some books that I just can't, I'll read the same line like 20 times and be like, okay, I'm not absorbing this. Yeah. There are some books that you just can't get through. That was that I, book for me. I read, there's a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I've maybe mentioned it on this program uh -huh. a half a dozen times. Um, when I first got the book, I must have been like 17, 18, or 19. was really young. And I couldn't make it through. Right. And then one year, something happened in my life. It just switched, flipped. And then I was able to make it through. And it was like this. Oh, it was because I carried with me, um, it was before phones had, you know, dictionaries on them. I carried with me an actual dictionary. Wow. And words I didn't understand, I would look up, write like on notes the in the, yeah, in the yeah. margins yeah. and it would make the reading slower, but I was able to understand it significantly better. Hmm. Um, and then as my vocabulary, cause I didn't have a really great vocabulary until I started reading more and more, which I think is correlates. Makes sense. Sure. Yeah. I didn't read much when I was in high school. And then as an adult, my, as in my twenties, I really amped up the reading. Greatest piece of advice I ever got was if you read one piece, one book a month in your area of X, you know, that you want to be an expert in, in 10 years, this is again, before, uh, before the internet really blew up. Oh, I'm old when I say that, but it's true. Um, if you read one book a month, over the course of 10 years, I've read 120 and theoretically you'll be in the top 1% of knowledge in your industry. Right. Um, I think today you could probably get that by finding the right content online mm -hmm. and not necessarily books. 
But anyway, long story short here, um, as my as as my vocabulary progressed, I was able to read that book specifically uh, more. And now I've read it over 20 times. But there are other books uh, that aren't, that are just written so terribly um, that getting through them is like, it has nothing to do with, with vocabulary. And has everything to do with presentation and like boring. It's just boring. Uh, and you know, those books suck. Well, I don't know about you, but I am easily bored. I've, maybe that's part of my personality type too. Um, mm. um, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily in the attention deficit category, but darn close. Yeah, me too. Do you have, do you prefer to read fiction or nonfiction? Non for sure. Me too. Yeah. Although I find fiction just difficult to remain that suspension of disbelief, I really have a hard time with that. Let me think. The The fiction that I like to read tends to be more paranormal than sci-fi. Okay. But it is in that category. Okay. So uh, I like Twilight. Mm -hmm. The young adult stuff, mm. that I can get into. I like the teenage, you know, like uh post apocalyptic I'm falling in love finding love but we're solving we're fixing the world you know where we're heroes that are you know fighting against this this world of you know that uh, doesn't matter they they they're going to you know be heroes um I enjoy that okay. but they're few and far between cuz the writing has to be really good mm. and twilight the writing was really good um also, what I liked about Twilight, oh no, no, that's something else. Twilight was really good. Uh, the Hunger Games, th that writing was really good. Um, and there are others out there that are really good. Dune, no, hmm. no. Frank Herbert is people like love him. Um, they love his world. They love his world building. I read Dune and I never want to pick up another Dune again. Um, it, Cause it's just not like I read it because the movie was coming out and I didn't want to be caught. Like I was caught with, with um, uh, Game of Thrones and the mm. Red Wedding. Okay. I didn't want to be caught like that again. You, you don't know? like that feeling? Of, of knowing something I should have known if I had just read the book. No, I think that, I oh, often okay, think... I was misinterpreting it. I thought you meant like caught off guard, like surprised, which is the enjoyable part of a show like Game of Thrones. Sure. I am of the opinion that the books make the shows far more enjoyable. Right. Because what okay. happens is the show cannot possibly capture everything in the book. Right. Otherwise, they'd be 16-hour yeah. long episodes. Yeah. But what they can do is hint at an Easter egg. And I like to know right. what those hints and Easter eggs are. Sure. And if you you've know? read the book, you pick up on little things. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and I learned this uh, after reading uh, Fight Club and wishing I had read Fight Club before mm, that was such I had fun. read. That's probably my favorite movie. Yeah. I, I wish I had read Fight Club before I saw the movie. Okay. Okay. But again, Fight Club is a short story. It's not right. Yeah. Um, so that then switched my opinion on everything. And I read uh I Am Legend before I watched I Am Legend. Okay. And the book is so much better than the movie. Okay. So much better. Yeah, back to Game of Thrones. I just yeah, I, sorry. that was probably my favorite TV series until Ooh. that last episode. And I'm like, what were they thinking here? But of course that's been so talked about too much. We don't need to talk about that. I just feel like someone out there's gotta redo that. Just use AI, redo the last episode. Well, it's clear that they tried to shove basically an entire another season <laughs> into that last scene. I guess part so much that bothers mixed. me is just how all the character they broke character almost all of them did they and they didn't solve their plot lines it was just like what the heck was that yeah the only so. the only thing that was uh i think predictable was him killing 
Khaleesi. Mm. That had to happen. Right. That had to happen. Yeah, it was just a very disappointing final episode. But anyway, uh, yeah, anyway. May, do you want to talk like some, uh, you know, Web3 stuff, you know, blockchain well, things or? I think all of this ties into it. <laughs> and, and, and because... <laughs> Um, we are way off topic today. That's all right. People, people love us. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> for all of our interests, uh, we're not just tech nerds. We also read. Um, yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about some Web three stuff. I, sure. I recently made the announcement on Twitter mm-hmm. that I was leaving Twitter. I was not leaving Twitter. I was putting Twitter in lurker mode. Right. Uh, to focus fully on products and services that are on chain. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I had missed this plot because I was distracted by so many other things for the last year. Um, That if I truly believe in decentralized technology, I should probably, and its potential future capabilities, and also want to see, like, in terms of my own career path, how this could impact work, I should be not just you know ankle and knee deep i should be like drowning in the, in the tech mm. uh and twitter felt along with my own personal feelings about where twitter crypto twitter is today um i feel like the move to farcaster and sort of any other on chain products and services is the right move right now hmm. what's your experience been like over the last it's kind of it's been a couple of weeks yeah, uh, well, I mean, I've been back and forth on Farcaster for uh, for years now. Sure. I was early You're talking adopter. mostly on Warpcast or other platforms? Uh, other platforms, too. So Warpcast is where everything... Warpcast is, is sort of like where things are kicking off for me. Yep. So it's where I'm discovering new products, um, old products that I'm being reminded of, like Paragraph. Not necessarily old products, but they're older in, in that they've been around for a while. Paragraph is a blogging, an on-chain blogging, you know, uh, service. And so, and it integrates with your, with your Farcaster account. Okay. So what I like about that, and the other thing that's pretty interesting about building a, fo- building a social graph on Farcaster is as other applications and services are built off the protocol, not WordCast, but the, the Farcaster protocol, you then get to bring your social graph with you you don't have to restart and find a new following on a new service right, again right right it's all you know? connected yeah and so that is also very intriguing to me because here i am on on farcaster having to on warpcast having to rebuild an audience and some and and some of my regret here is that i didn't do it and stay there two years ago when i first jumped on the platform mm. um, i was hemming and hauling back and forth because i'd built a following it's you know for some maybe fifteen thousand is a lot for me i went from 81 to fifteen thousand over four years on twitter i felt proud of that it was sure. based off of my own art yep you know and i was but what i found is i was holding so much holding on to like that vanity metric without any return anymore on mm. what it actually meant so talk to me about having... building a following a lot of people are interested in that what were your doing it now building a following now in this time in this environment what are your methods to doing that they are talking warpcast now i'm assuming oh uh, let's talk warpcast because i think yeah. that's where everything's going to jump off so first let's say this warpcast isn't the only forecaster client sure there's i think supercast and some others yeah. so if you're not happy with how the team behind Farcaster is also building Warpcast. Mm-hmm. If you're not happy with that, with Warpcast, you can go to another client. So, you know, there are other people right now that are like, there are some rewards around other social tokens and people are being like on Warpcast that are being flagged as spam because of their behavior. Mm. So the good news. To get to- yeah. Token farming. Yeah. The good news is you can go to another you can go to another platform. Mm-hmm. So, you but know, back to my like question, Twitter. like building a following, what what are you doing to have that happen? Yeah. So, uh, I, and starting from zero again, right. mentally, um, yep. I don't have the, I've shut down second realm. 
Mm. I've I basically feel like I'm starting from zero. So I'm doing everything that I've talked about. I'm trying to be in the past. I'm trying to be genuine about my interactions. Okay. I'm not trying to f- in, uh, you can engagement farm and build your build your following that way. For me, that's not going to work. That's mm-hmm. not true to my values. It's not because I want to be able to look back in 10 years and be like, I didn't chill not cringing some at what bullshit. You, yeah, yeah I'm sure that I'll cringe anyway, sure. but it'll, it should be about things that I care about and my opinions have changed as opposed to things I promoted and people can look back and be like, it'll what grow. Super ro- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what am I doing? Uh, I'm doing two things. I'm not making art right now and I will be making art soon. Uh, well, I'm, I've been making art. I'm not sharing it publicly, um, but I just started blogging again. Okay. And I'm using paragraph. Um, and is that paragraph.xyz? It is. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'm hoping to sort of build an audience through, through that okay. um, by sharing my thoughts and ideas. And then my primary motivation for using paragraph is uh, the contents immutable. It's stored mm-hmm. in Arweave and it's composable, which means in the future, barring any post-apocalyptic EMP event, um, when I die, the information will still be public and people can still build on it. You know, is this like so a daily blog you're doing? I'm I've yeah, I'm gonna set up a daily blog. Yeah. And it's okay. just gonna be like let me read what I wrote so that people don't get it twisted and why uh why I'm writing it. Uh so the audience is probably, it's not going to be techie. It's not going to be uh, artsy too much. But um, I've always, the way I put this is I've always wanted to leave something uh, for my, I don't have any kids. Uh, if I had kids, I would have, I would have wanted to leave something for them. Uh-huh. But I have niece, I have a niece and two nephews that okay. I've always wanted to leave something behind if, and they're young right now, so they don't really understand too much about the world. They're they're just 10, 11, and right. 12. Like they're just getting into into understanding like the world around them. Um, so my hope is that the things that I leave here can act, act as sort of like a guide for them in the future. Huh. Um, as an uh, as, as as me, I always wanted something left behind from my uncle. Mm. Uh, who when I was he died when I was uh, when I was 10 or 11 12 actually oh shit I just made the connection about why this might be coming up right now wow that's interesting yeah so he died he passed when I was around uh, it was 88 I was 10 um, and he's my godfather and I was very close to him but his words aren't there's nothing there's pictures and there's memories, but beyond that, there's nothing left behind, right? Sure. Uh, and so my thought is I want to leave some, a little bit of something of myself behind for my nieces and nephews to be like, well, what would it have Uncle Rosie, which is what they call me, what would have Uncle Rosie, you know, left, done in this situation? Or what advice does Uncle Rosie have? And uh, when I do leave this earth, they'll have, they'll have something left behind for them. Wow. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Huh. Yeah. So it's it's a blog, but it's not necessarily addressing your typical audience then. No, uh, but it is the same kind of content. So okay. in the I had a newsletter in the past and I wrote about like finding your path and all kinds of things and uh-huh. you know how 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 you could build an audience and um remixing and you know all this kind of stuff. So all of that's going to come into play here, mm, okay. but it's going to be broader too. Like mm-hmm. um, it'll be a little bit of advice for them, but also advice that anybody could really, if they want to attach themselves to and use potentially um, like this recent one, I'll, I'll just tell you, it's called a maps and journeys. And the short version is like, um, you know, how people give like, lists listicles of like if you did these 10 things sure 36 months you'll and then you know come back in 36 months and tell me how your life has changed um so 
with the real the, the reality is it's not the list that does it it's it's you taking action right the journey that mm-hmm. you're on doing that list and so that's sort of like what i talk about in the first post is there are maps and there are journeys a map is something you use to guide you on your journey but the journey is lived through it is experienced and there's a difference between knowing knowing how to do something and then actually doing it mm-hmm. and so that's what you know just st- little stuff like that it's not going to be long-winded i don't want it to be i don't want it to be like long posts i want it to be like short a minute read you know that's searchable in the future sure. and then yeah. maybe i could you know turn it into something who knows but huh. that's what i was thinking there yeah I- i'm not thinking about my typical audience so much as i am thinking about who who i want to connect with hmm. so i don't know like when i when we say typical audience i think you mean like the crypto yeah. nft sure yeah mm-hmm. um i don't know that it's important for me to want to connect with only them anymore right like only people interested in that i think by being on farcaster where builders and crypto enthusiasts and nft artists and artists and web3 world just by being in that space I'm connecting with that audience, but now I'm looking for uh, a deeper connection with people in that audience who then connect with me on a, on a more specific level. Does How's the sense? atmosphere on Warpcast comparative to say, like, on, if you look on crypto Twitter now, it's so, I, I can't think of a better word than polluted with political just toxicity um is that coming through on warpcast i think you have the benefit of it being a smaller community right now okay and because of that and because because i think monetizing the community is harder let's say on warpcast Mm-hmm. You're not you're not seeing a lot of that. There's political posts. They tend to be a little bit more uh, analytical. A little is significantly less of that like angsty Twitter. Everybody's Just out to get you to make you angry, kind of thing. Yeah, there's so much. There's almost none of that. Uh, and if there is some of that, you can you could politely ignore it, and it doesn't affect your feed. Right. Um, I mean, sometimes I'm interested in it, uh, but I just find yeah. it's it's hard to avoid it now on Twitter. Now, of course, being an election period, you expect it. So the one one more thing I wanted to add about building an audience mm-hmm. is I remember how unintentional it was um, that my focus was building an audience on Twitter. My focus was creating things I liked and doing things I liked and then connecting with people who also liked it. Right. And then as a result, an audience got built up because of that. So it doesn't like, for me, it doesn't start with what's the audience number I have in mind. It's, it's, that's a, and that's, that's the, I guess that's the visualization or sort of end result of the work that I did before, not the goal, right? Mm -hmm. So my goal necessarily isn't to reach 15,000 people on Farcast or Warpcast now. My goal is to connect with people again, because that was missing for so long for me on Twitter, who also enjoy the things that I make. And maybe right. that's only 2,000 people this time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it's only 2,000 people, but maybe it is. I think in a way we did get spoiled again when you look back at the NFT phenomenon. Um, you were there a little before me. Um, yeah. When I came in, NFTs were still a pretty novel thing. 
there wasn't a lot of talk of big money. You know, people were selling them and tr- flipping them and trading them with each other for, you know, mm-hmm. five bucks, ten bucks. Um, occasionally, there'd be some big sale that people like, holy cow, somebody sold one for $10,000 or things like that. Yeah. Um, and it was more just, you know, here were some people playing with something and it was fun and creative. And then there was a following that came with that. And it wasn't like you say the goal wasn't to build a following. The following Mm -hmm. came. It was like, build it and they'll come kind of idea. You know, like, uh, isn't that the quote? I forget from what the Kevin Costner movie, what was it called? Feel the dreams. dreams. You know, like it was. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. You know, um, the notion being not so much that you're setting out to build up this audience, but you're just doing something that's interesting to you. And other people also find it interesting and kind of join you on that journey, you know? Yeah. Um, And now, of course, that audience, you know, for a a large part of that audience has left because of NFTs kind of dying off. And honestly, between NFTs and meme coins, I'm sorry, meme coins are just kind of boring in comparison. Um, I just don't find them interesting at all. It's just, to me, it's just another means by which one can gamble. Like not that different from say a slot machine. Um, and that actually brought me to my point that I want to talk to you about is that there's been some murmurs, at least I've been on Twitter still more so than Warpcast murmurs of some reasons. Some people are saying, I don't know why, but some like figures that are well known in the space are saying suggesting at least that nfts are starting to mount some sort of comeback now i don't know what evidence there is for that but i'm seeing it from numerous people now some people are joking that the nfts are coming back for their bags only like brian brinkman uh but like rarible was like saying nfts are back right and then they said follow it up with nfts never left right um or there's like people like uh uh, Medved, Matt Medved, who is saying that people are looking for NFTs to come back, and that he's bullish. Um, what do you think of that? Like, is there any evidence to support this at all that they're making a comeback? Have there been some big sales lately that are pointing to that? Or do you know? I, le, le, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Let's start real quick. Uh, you brought up meme coins. I promise we'll get into NFTs. You brought up <laughs> meme coins. Um, so in the Farcaster world and on Twitter, meme coins are all over. Yep. In the Warcast, in the Farcaster ecosystem, they're still tipping in meme coins, which you already right. know how I feel about that. Yep. I think it devalues the the uh, the products that and the content that people are creating. Because why don't you just tip in actual valuable money? Sure. Right. And then, you know, I get the pushback from people who say, well, D- DGEN was the only ecosystem wide tipping, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't really feel like going into how any, you know, anyway, how the US dollar has been an ecosystem wide tipping mechanism forever. Um, how on games, there have been in app, in game tipping forever. How on f- Telegram, it's, We've been tipping forever. We don't need more evidence that tipping will occur. We don't need other currencies, in my opinion, to bring value to artists. The way you bring value to artists is by paying them in valuable currency. Well, because ultimately, what do you do with those meme tokens? You cash them into ETH. Theoretically. Right? So (laughs) just pay them in ETH then. I mean, ETH transactions are costing like a couple of cents now. On LA. Right. And and so my, my comeback is usually I'm all for tipping. Tip me in Bitcoin, sure. tip me in Ethereum, tip me in USD, tip me in USDC. Sure. Why won't you do that? To be and fair, then, though, th- Eric, there was a time where that wasn't really feasible. And it still points back, I feel, to 4844, where they allowed the, the blob uh they basically enabled very much lower gas fees on Ethereum with oh, I'm L2, sorry. L2 support. EIP4844, I think it was. I got confused. I, yeah. I thought you were talking about uh, three hours capital, and I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. What the hell does 3AC no. have to do? <laughs> no, the EIP, I think it was 4844, yeah. that basically that a, scaled Ethereum, and it succeeded. Yeah. And what's funny is people are now saying, oh, Ethereum gas fees are so low. It's like dead. It's like, no. 
it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, right? And right. all these L2s are now working as intended. And eventually, as the L2s get bigger, like base is going to be huge in a year or two. Ethereum will accrue fees from that and all these other L2s. Yeah. But my, my point that I'm driving at is there was a time where tipping in ETH wasn't all that feasible because if you wanted to tip somebody a dollar and it cost you $5 to tip them, well, that's silly. So then you could tip in these meme tokens, right? Totally agree. Uh, I'm, of course, being cynical here because I have been down the social token world before. Yeah. Um, you know, in the two in the in 2020, before the multiple waves of social token crazes we've seen on Solana and in in the Farcaster world, uh, we were doing social tokens. Yep. Right, and so I, I always felt like I experimented. I saw the end game. It doesn't really make sense to for most people to create an internal currency. Right. So that's how that's where my my bias is coming from with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, now now we've we've got this sort of social token. Let's talk about let's talk about NFTs. Right? Uh, Are they back? What, what is back? <laughs> I don't sales. I guess is that what's being implied by that? By who? Have there been some big sales lately? Like all I'm seeing is in no. my feed is people going, "Yeah, NFTs are making a comeback." With nothing to now, is there something I've missed? Yeah, well, they're making a comeback because they're giving them away for free. Okay, so this was uh, Zora switched to free, and I think what's the new one that you mentioned? R Rodeo. Rodeo. Are, are they doing free mints? I have no idea. Isn't I haven't it? been on the platform. Okay. I mean, I'm on it, but I haven't used it. So I don't really, I believe they're also doing free mints. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. For My them. impression was it was like kind of like a zero one type thing where they're free. Right. So they're basically. Okay. <laughs> Let me rationalize this because I'm doing paragraph for my blog. Sure. Which you can mint. Okay. Uh, you can mint posts. Mm -hmm. for free okay if you want to mint a post for free that's fine so the um, minting itself is free yeah like you're not you just have to pay a network fee yeah 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 but like you could you can own the token to my post what i mean to say um, is people consuming the token they're not paying anything for it it's a free right. token for them to, it's a free uh, token. to to acquire you can charge okay uh, I just I chose not to, and I think a lot of people are choosing not to. Um, I, I again, I think most people don't have a following enough to, to say, judge. right, you should buy this post because it's going to be valuable in the future. Yeah, you know, especially if it's free to read. Yeah. So, so where I'm correlating this is, if the same concept is being used to essentially in rodeo to create create an Instagram type app where people can see your work for free and then collect a token of it for free. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see how that values an artist's work. Why not? Is just that stick... on an L2 or is it Solana or what is it? Oh, it's on L2. It's on base, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just didn't want to assume. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't want to assume either. I I just assume base because everybody's building on base, so it would make sense that it's on base. I mean, especially if it's in the Farcast ecosystem, it's most yeah. likely. I I don't know what I think of it. I mean, if the intention is for just to be like a, another Instagram type environment, then okay, I guess free is okay. Um, as an artist or creator, though, what does that say about? your work i don't know well like and the platform's making money off of it how are they making yeah, money? On, on transaction fees i bet right yeah so you're telling me the artist creates the work mints it mm -hmm. people collect it for free other than a transaction fee and a network fee the artist gets nothing I guess so. I mean, I haven't. Yeah, that's they get awareness. 
Now, I guess in many ways, that's just like the old Web 2 formula. Yeah. Well, let's let's look at it this way. Is it Nothing's, any better? No, I don't think so. Um, I think people are... I think... It's maybe not worse, though. It's pretty much just... I have to, I have to, because I want to yell right now. <laughs> I have to, I have to, like, I'm controlling my emotion. <laughs> I'm feeling a myriad of emotions here. I feel like we're working backwards. Yeah, it feels like that. Yes. I feel like we're some people, we're so starved. We are, I use that as broad, not not really for me, but I mean like collectively mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. a creator base, let's say artists in the web three. We're so starved for attention because so much of it is now meme coin and election and memes um, that we're willing to give up. Then some might be willing to give up the very thing that we were working towards which was a, an, a more equitable system. Equitable? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to be careful about using equity because I, I, well, we use that for now. And then if I feel like I need to change it at some point, I will. Mm -hmm. But a more equitable system. Now we're a moving system away that from benefits that. the creators more. Right. Right. Again, this comes down to a lot of what I'm interested in academically shadow work hidden work um taking advantage of the creator to build your platform um which to me is, it, just, it feels as extractive as the web 2 ecosystem like you you used to hear people saying as a critique of web 2 you are the product yeah right if you're getting it for free you're the product and we're kind of back to there right yeah, yeah. The and this is what I was getting at. The the creator is the artist, the again, Dracula too. If you're putting videos on that platform, you're helping to Dracula, is that the right app? I don't even I know. I think so. Uh there is a give and take. You're helping to build the platform. The the, the But in that case they're earning, are they not? They're earning some tokens? Are they maybe. not? Maybe. Okay, I don't know. Maybe. I think maybe on Rodeo, you might be earning tokens too. But again, what are we talking about? Are we talking about meme coins? Because if meme coins and social currency, um, I, th I think that I think it's a dangerous... I, th I think there's a mental model that isn't... That sounds fun. Like, oh, what happens if meme coins such and such that I earn by posting on this platform explodes to a dollar per? It's never going to explode to a dollar per. 99.999% of these meme coins are going to zero. Yeah. Even your social tokens. Yeah. They might be valuable in platform. But they're going they're, they're never going to be as valuable as you expect them to be. Okay, let me take on my debater devil's advocate position Please. here for a second. So, I'm coming in and looking at this and going, "Look, guys, $10,000 NFTs were ridiculous. $1,000 JPEGs were ludicrous that was never sustainable this is just reality this is realistic selling your stuff for pennies that are jpegs is more in line with reality of what they ought to be selling for mm. what are your thoughts bitcoin is fake internet money mm -hmm. and it's gonna go to zero because it's fake internet money. like i that logic doesn't work um I, I, Could you not say though that there have been numerous instances of NFTs that were clearly overvalued? Sure. Same, like look same at board apes. Said. Look at how like ridiculous they were. Sure. That's not exclusive to NFTs or any market. Of course not. So. So like I understand what you're saying. I, I think the the issue isn't the market's action or it's shifting, or it's, you know, peaks and valleys. I think it's the mental model people have mm -hmm. about what 
what the market is. Um, the idea that NFT, it comes back to, uh, for me, right from the beginning, the idea that people were selling the NFT is the art. NFT right. isn't the art. NFT is the mechanism by which you can purchase the art or trade the art or collect the whatever it is, art, music, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. It's the token. And the token is is what proves ownership and what and what allows you to transfer it to and fro using any any number of mechanisms, trading, whatever. Um that has to be separated from people's mindset because yes, there is some art that is not worth trading, but if you're it's your buddies and you're collecting shit back and forth with them and it's cool, well, by all means you want to do so for a penny. It doesn't cost you much, but you can say, Hey, I got my friend's art in yeah. here, but I tend to think of myself and put my, and maybe this is delusional or maybe, maybe, Maybe uh, maybe I think of myself too, too grand, but I think of myself as the kind of artist who could be sold at uh, Sotheby's and wants and and, and is going to be in the museums in the future. Okay, but Eric, though, like ninety nine percent of the people creating NFTs during that whole explosion are not in that category. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And yeah. there are a large percentage of them were making decent money from it. Yeah, and it. It, and good for and them. That's, I could argue that's not realistic. That's not realistic, but there was a lot of shitty art making a lot of money. There still is. It will always be shitty art that makes money. It's it's not about the. It's not always about the art. Okay. Right. The the quality of there are some. I have come across some fantastic, technical, amazing artists in the world mm -hmm. who can draw significantly better than me. Who can mm -hmm. draw significantly better than X Copy and Brian Brinkman and like, but they're not going to sell in this space right. to this audience because yep. of a myriad of reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a difference between technically good art and good for a market. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I'm just sticking with this debater thing, and I'm just saying, like a very large percentage of the market was severely overvalued. And so perhaps this is a more realistic scenario. And if you're a, one of these companies that's been trying to run an NFT platform and month after month, you're seeing your volume dwindle mm. to mm. the point that you're shuttering the doors or ready to do so, you know, you might be going, we need to rethink this. Mm -hmm. Nobody's okay. buying these things for a thousand dollars or whatever. Okay, there was I saw a, I saw something recently, and, and you triggered it by reminding me here. Um, sometimes we create products and services that are for the point zero 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 one percent that understand what we're building and 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 uh, highly tech highly technical and. You know, and maybe there's an audience for that. And maybe that's the audience that I, as a creator, want to be in. Right. But there is the 99.9% .9 that just want to like put stuff online yep. and have fun. And maybe they, maybe they build an audience and then start getting paid later. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And so there are apps, I think, maybe like Rodeo, who, okay, we're taking a step back, let's say, from what, what I believed was the ethos, right? Yep. And now we're starting to onboard in a way that is a little bit more friendly. That's good too. And mm -hmm. and I shouldn't I shouldn't like shut that down. I should I should be like conscious of where I think where I'd like to be and play versus where maybe a broader audience isn't isn't interested in being. Yeah. You know? It reminds me of talks I had with people who are on wax and they were saying, look, the ethl one and platforms like Super Rare and Known Origin, Maker's Place, that's your art gallery. Whereas Wax, that's your gift shop. That's where you go to buy the poster or you buy mm. the souvenir. And yeah, they're not the same thing. And that's okay. Yeah, and there's the aspect of, and I talked about composability and immutability before too. Mm -hmm. So let's let's move, like I want it for, for the purposes of this, 
I want to move the valuation of the art out of the equation. Okay. Uh, a rodeo might be good because if I'm dead and gone in 30 years, 40 years, my art would still, that I shared on rodeo, will still be online. Mm -hmm. Tokens will still be tradable, theoretically. Um, and let's say, like a Van Gogh, my art gets more valuable 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line after I'm dead. And now my wallet is controlled by whoever, and they get 10% of the, if if royalties are involved, get 10% of the royalties. I could see a situation where that could work. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so I don't want to shut it down completely. And maybe I've been a little too crass in my own frustrations because of where I feel like I want to play versus where a lot of innovations See, I, being traded, being like, created. I think today. of somebody like Andy Warhol, I think he'd be all over stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible. Right. Eric, he'd have why, his why, high end stuff, of course. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why am I such a gatekeeper? <laughs> What's my problem here? I'm just trying to pick the other side of the argument here. Cause I'm kind of with you. Like I do feel like it's extractive and I do feel that, the the main beneficiaries of it are not the creators but at the same time you know the reality is most of those creators aren't making money right now anyway with the other yeah formula and most we hoped would work and most of those creators haven't built up an awareness like you or i or even people who have a, more of an awareness that in the space mm-hmm like there's there's an aware we've been playing in I say play because I think that that makes more sense. We've been playing in Web three for for five years, let's say theoretically, mm -hmm. around there, together five years, longer for crypto, right? But yep. playing in this right. NFT it, world, yep. people totally. people know who we are, which we have seen throughout history, and you know, just you you. There is a social benefit to having been in the business, mm -hmm. you know. So maybe maybe rodeo is good for people who don't really have a a, a profile yet, you know. Like sort of, I don't I know. Mean, I remember when Ro when zero one was new, and I had a lot of fun with it, and then just the the dopamine wore off for me after a little while. Yeah, I got in trouble on zero one. Did you? Yeah, well, you know, I started minting long art because their UI, uh, right? Okay, you know, was allowed for. It was you know poor mishap, um, and and you know, doing what we always did, which was in a way I think of it like hacking. You know, we're hacking, but sure. we cr created pushing and, boundaries and, and seeing what breaks. Yeah, and so you know the the founders didn't necessarily like it um and i didn't like that they didn't like it because they were the same people who were all about what we were doing on super rare sure you know like oh it's good for super rare but not good for you like that doesn't track for me mm. and so right then and there i was what was I, the I, point of critique with the what you were doing what was the bone to pick we were just having fun on the platform okay like the, with the and what was the problem though like what was the issue there was no issue. We were just cr making long art because it, you could. Sure. And this was right? a problem? It was, apparently. They didn't Can't you they, elaborate. They were at first they what happened was they were censoring the art. So anything below that was bigger than a certain amount was not being shown in the home. Cuz it was screwing up the the interface. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So instead of just fucking fixing it, their short-term solution was censorship, which immediately for me, it's like, you, you put, can't stand that. <laughs> cannot, cannot. And also it's, <laughs> it's like, it was like, like the, the person who one of the founders of the platform was a big supporter of trash art. Right. And censorship was a big reason for trash arts growth. Right. Right. And so all of a sudden you're going to allow censorship on your platform just because it's something you don't like that doesn't track for me. 
Like, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It's pretty hard to escape anytime there's a central entity in control. Yeah. Like, even, anyway. you know, free speech platform X, there's still stuff that Musk will censor on there if he feels that it's critical of him, for example. Totally. Totally. I'm not, I am not saying they aren't within their rights. What yeah. I'm saying is the the founder's principles that were espoused when we were and and he was in support of with regards to super rare all of a sudden dis disappeared yeah. when it was his platform yeah like that doesn't track for me like, yeah. first it was fun haha you could have left it fixed it and nothing would have you know happened mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. i left I, I stopped using besides free mints after a while well, that was the you problem know, I had. And again, I've told you before, I, I get bored quickly and I yeah. had fun with it for a week or two. And it was neat to see, you know, a whole bunch of people scoop up your art like instantly, like, wow, you know, people really like that one. And boom, 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 they're all scooped up. Right. Um, but then you're like, what at the end of the day, what's the point of this? Yeah, I think that there's opportunity to explore how to use free mints a little bit more uh, consciously. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you're building an audience or, you know, what that might look like or... Or if there's know, something to the usage of the token that comes from that in one way or another. Right, like I could think like, okay, maybe maybe I'm going to have, like with Paragraph, excuse me, you can token gate posts. Okay. That might be cool, right? Like here's a mm -hmm. here's a free mint. You could, you, this post, whatever, whatever might be in this post, I don't know. I haven't thought of that that far, but the point is like that's pretty cool that you can token gate content and maybe you could do free mint and token gate it for those who have this specific thing, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever reason, and it does this. Lots of opportunity, right? There's lots of opportunity to play and explore with tokenization, which is mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. But just free minting to free mint, be careful. Is I yeah. think the the appropriate way to think about that. Yeah. It's um, yeah. I'm not even sure what I really think about it, honestly. No, I think I don't. I don't think we. Here's the thing. I don't think we need to have an answer, right? Because we, it's an opportunity to explore what all of this means. Mm -hmm. I can see how it'd be fun, like you know. And is yeah. that a bad thing? No, we're not going to know the impact of free minting on the creator creator economy mm -hmm. until it's been studied after a decade and a half of maybe people giving away free mints. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we can extrapolate, was there value in it or wasn't there? Who knows? Um, you know, I do feel like the value prop for Solana is just slowly diminishing. What's Solana? <laughs> I, I just feel I like have... what's the point. And I know I've said this before, but yeah, like, it might as well just be another L2, honestly. It, I, I think Which, I there's think nothing as, wrong with that, really. No, but I think it's fine. I think, I think like Tezos, like people have their community, and if it's mm -hmm. there, and then great, good for you. Like, if that's mm -hmm. where, if that's where your people are, by all means, like, yeah. not everybody needs to be. This is the, this is, this is a, an important aspect of decentralization. Not everybody needs to be right. on okay. X platform. Yep. If Solana works for you, great. If Tezos works for you, great. If L2 is the only thing that you like and that's where you want to play, that's great too. Mm -hmm. uh, I just I guess the whole argument L1. of it being the ETH killer, it's just like, no, that argument's dead. Forget it. That's not true. That was always that was always marketing. Yeah. Always marketing. It was always going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Wow. We were... Highly, it's a highly opinionated episode of. Yeah. Did you see really quick? We don't want. I don't want to get too much into politics, but did you see that poly markets got Trump and Harris dead even now? I mean, I saw that. It's interesting. I what take I, I take betting over polls any day. Like to me, betting has more validity yeah. to it than some poll from whatever. But I. I think what's more interesting, the betting aside, and, and maybe it's even more accurate than polls, right? I think more interesting is how people swung so quickly in support of Harris after 
after she was clearly being bet on as the worst VP in history. It's just manufactured. Yeah. 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 And, and then and, as and, soon as she said, oh, hey, by the way, I'm communist, it's like, <laughs> Wait, she said she was communist? I haven't. She didn't say that. No. Oh. She said, we need to have price controls on groceries. <laughs> So, oh, okay. right, right, right. She started right. espousing like socialist kind of. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like that day, like Washington Post, uh, CNN, like very pro Dem platforms were like, no, this is garbage. Yeah. Yeah. And her numbers plummeted just in a single day from that. It's, it's because she can't be left without a teleprompter. No. She, she, the, the left. I, I think Obama was really great at being able to, or at least it made it look like he was able to be very quippy yep. and um, handle off off the cuff responses. So was uh, uh, Bush was terrible <laughs> putting food uh, on Clinton, your family. Clinton, Clinton was pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, Reagan really good. Um, mm -hmm. There are some people who are really good off the mic, you know, off the cuff. But yep. uh, she's terrible. Yeah, terrible, well, terrible, that's terrible why they've kept her away from interviews and press conferences and so forth. Yeah, yeah. I just think psychologically, she just says the same speech repeatedly from place to place. Well, I mean, she can't say, she can't do anything else. Uh, I, I I just think that like I'm 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 I, I want to analyze. I wish I was in a position to be able to analyze what was it that switched people's minds to then fall in line with like, what, what is the thing that made people fall in line with Kamala? You have to, it, you have to strategically stand behind her and be like, yeah, she's our person. Like she's going to win because you have to stand behind that person. If you were to start saying, eh, I don't know about this Harris, the whole campaign falls apart. So you have to pretend that you're like, yeah, she's the best. I mean, of course they did that with, with uh, Joe. So Sure. Well, and you can make a lot of the same arguments for Trump. I mean, is he good at speaking off the cuff? He says no, a lot of stupid shit. He does. <laughs> he does. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to, you know what? Come, I'm not trying to make a judgment here uh, on, I guess I was making a judgment. He, <laughs> he's just, you know what it is? He's more entertaining. He's far more entertaining. Yeah. And, and that, I think, is a value <laughs> add. Yeah. Well, and I honestly feel like a lot of these news outlets and like uh, evening comedy and stuff, they kind of secretly hope Trump wins because that's a win for them. Did. Like, of course they did. They're going to get way higher viewing numbers yeah. with him. Yeah. She's, you know, she's just so boring. I just, I was saying to some people the other day, this is very reminiscent to me of the Hillary Clinton Trump uh election cycle and everybody being like hillary's the one she's gonna do it 91 percent for hillary nine percent for trump in a poll or whatever it was and yeah, it's like Hillary's, no guys you're just making that up <laughs> hillary is infinitely more likable than harris yeah i would yeah. agree yes and so like i think it's worse i'm yeah. just saying it feels a lot like it where yeah you know, there were genuine people. Now, whether you agree with their politics or not, I feel like Bernie Sanders is a more authentic person. Okay. He is far left, yeah. um, but he has a certain likability to him that I think if they'd have put Sanders up against uh, Trump way back in 2016, he might have won. But point being, they are putting these people in place that they want them in there in that position, but not necessarily voters want them. The voters are, I mean, was Harris was, she didn't even go through a primary. Right. So. No, but the delegates of, you know, of the States. Anyway, we can, we don't need to go into the civics of it all, but no, I'm just saying to me, it's a terrible choice. Who knows? Maybe the, we'll get a curveball here at the DNC. Yeah, part of it is the only way that they could use the funding um, and the reason that she's on the ticket still is because the only way they can completely use all the funding that they raised with Joe is if she remained on the ticket. Yes. And it's yeah. like hundreds of millions of dollars at this point. Yeah, it was 230 
when when uh when he left when he decided to drop out yeah and now it's like 300 400 it's like ridiculous yeah anyway. i don't know man feels still like it was a bad choice to me it was the only choice really that dnc had to there was no they would lose all kinds of money there was no and then they wouldn't be able to to mount a campaign like they have with with kamala in order to change the political opinion of an entire base trump came up with a new nickname for her what is it comrade kamala <laughs> let's leave it and at that here this you have to play on that that's the thing americans i mean i'm canadian we're a little more left wing here if there's yeah. anything americans despise it's communism <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We were, we, we were, we were, uh, I forget the exact word that I want to use, but <laughs> institute, like we were, it was institutionalized to hate communism. Yeah. I mean, Canada generally has a more of a mixed economy than the United yeah. States does. The United States is a little less, uh, I wouldn't call it a, in Canada, I wouldn't call it a command economy. That'd be like China. Right. Yeah. But Canada is kind of in between. There's elements of the economy that are more controlled. Yeah. Um, so we don't quite, get our uh we don't quite get as as like whoa what are you talking about when things like price controls are mentioned but the average american hears that it's like screw that <laughs> yeah and the i would say the average voting american uh grew up in the 80s yeah where we were right in the middle of the cold war so everything was like you know fuck the communists yeah you know that's gonna be anyway. her downfall man i'm calling it Comrade Kamala. <laughs> I'm for it. Yeah. All right, man. All right. Have a great week. You too.